I remember receiving a, a phone call from Becky and he's like, Indio, what are you doing? Where are you at? You're heavy in my heart. And I knew it deep inside that I was at fault, but I would never admit it to myself. And I would never admit that to anybody else. And that's how much pride I had. Here I am, I'm clubbing, I'm drinking, I'm driving around drunk, I'm smoking cigarettes, smoking cigars, and wasting my life away. My name is Pastor Indio, and this is how I came alive. I remember about five years ago, um, I was encountering just a lot of thoughts in my mind, a lot, a lot of things going on. Um, during this time, I was living with my sister, and my sister had referred me to some Christian counsel that I thought I, I didn't need. I thought I was good. I thought that as long as um, I could keep continuing reading, reading the Word and just praying, attending church, I thought that I was good. One day I was um, driving a company vehicle, making a delivery, and this vehicle happened to be a, a bulk truck, and I was carrying CO2 behind me, a high pressure CO2. And in the highway, all these thoughts came, came around, the, the thoughts of just loneliness. I, I found myself in a very dark place. I had gone through betrayal with people that were just closest to me. I thought that, you know, me giving and giving and giving to people and serving people um, I, I was expecting for, for, for me to receive that in return, but I didn't. So I remember this moment, this, this particular day I was driving this truck and just the thought of just ending it all, just quitting in life, the thought of just not caring any longer, or um, the thought of like me living didn't, didn't have value. Didn't, I didn't have any value. I didn't have any value to go back home to. Um, and I remember driving this truck, I was probably doing about 60 in the highway and, and the thought that kept coming to mind, just run this truck into that bridge or run to the car next to you, just end it all. You know, life is over. You will never have another chance. You will never recover from this. You will never be able to love again. You will never be loved again. And I dealt with this, like this sense of like self-worth that I felt like I was, I wasn't worth anything. During this time in my life, I was about 28 years old and and I thought that I was like in, in, in like this climax of life. You know, I, I, I thought my relationships were good. I was looking into like personal investments. I was looking into retirement, um, making some financial decisions just um, for my future. And then all of a sudden the world just goes dark. And again, during this time, I was a pastor. I, I was serving in the local church. Um, you know, I already had his child of the age of like seven, eight years old during this time. And then I found myself, life like kind of threw me a curveball that I was not expecting. I couldn't even dream or wish on this moment for anybody else. And, and here, I, here I am, I find myself in this situation. And I remember during the time that I was con you know, considering just turning the wheel in this truck and just running into something. I remember receiving a, a phone call from Becky and it's like, Indio, what are you doing? Where are you at? You're heavy in my heart. Um, please call me and, and I remember looking at my phone and I remember just responding. I remember parking the truck in the side of the road and just started to weep because I knew that if this call wouldn't come through my phone or this text message wouldn't come through and my sister had not reached out, I don't know where would I be today. And I remember parking the truck in the side of the road and, and calling her and just weeping. I, I couldn't even express what I was feeling and I just, I just seen myself in a very dark place in my life with no hope. I had nothing to look forward to. And I remember she had already made an appointment for me with this um, Christian counselor that she had referred me to. And at this moment in, in the, of desperation, I decided to take the company truck back to the company um, and jump in my vehicle and straight, go straight to this place. And I remember sitting down with a lady that greeted me very warmly as she asked me a few questions. And I just began to weep. I began to weep and express I, I, real dark thoughts and heart things that I felt in my heart that I had never expressed before. You know, so sometimes in life you, you look at other people going through situations and, and you never even think or dream that you would one day go through those situations or even understand how they're feeling. And that was my moment, my moment, my lowest moment in my life. Um, I sat down with this lady and I had expressed all this anger and everything that I had gone through that I could not comprehend. And I didn't even know a way out. And I remember going through at least like two or three weeks um, sitting down with this lady. And then I decided to quit. She began to ask me some really deep questions and she began to get, get very personal with me about some things. And there was areas in my life that I just didn't want to admit, areas of pride, 
areas where I, I became super controlling in relationships, area that I had to admit, and I knew it deep inside that I was at fault, but I would never admit it to myself. And I would never admit that to anybody else. And that's how much pride I had. So I, I remember just kind of canceling and walking away from my last meeting with that lady. And I said, I will never go back to her. She will never be able to help me. So here I am in another season of life, thinking like I had already gone through this. I decided to go into another relationship, thinking that I'm already healed, thinking that I'm healthy enough, thinking that I'm ready to move on with my life, thinking that another relationship is what's, is what's going to bring me resolution. It's what's going to bring me hope again. It's what's going to bring me joy again. And then, and then again, in this relationship, I found to be betrayed. I, I found myself to be um, hurt again. I found myself giving and not receiving. I found myself empty again. And at the end of this relationship, I felt even worse than the first time. And then I was really in a dark place. I felt alone. I felt, I felt betrayed. From this moment forward, I thought, like, you know what? I'm just going to probably spend a few years alone in my life and, and just do some do some some of what people consider like me time and i um at this time in my life i turned to alcohol i remember start attending bars things that i would I, places i thought i would never go into i started attending nightclubs places that i said i, I would never i remember preaching about how people were in these places and I, and I i thought of myself i was like i would never attend these places and here i am i'm clubbing i'm drinking i'm driving around drunk I'm smoking cigarettes, smoking cigars, and wasting my life away, thinking that this will bring hope, that this will bring peace in my life. I remember one time just laying down in bed, getting home drunk, and it was probably about 3.30, 4.30 in the morning. And I remember, man, God, if you hear, if you're, if you hear my voice, and I remember I was sleeping at my brother's basement at this time, and I told God, if you hear my voice, if you're still there, and, and I'm just sitting there and just shut I just said a small prayer and said, if you hear my voice, I pray that you will remove, remove these things from me, these desires. I had gone through a stage in life, but I just didn't care. And I was afraid because if, if I was continued down this path, I didn't know what, what the world or what life was going to bring back at me. And I, was, I kept thinking of my son, and that's really all, the only reason. I, I was like, man, I have to clean up my life. I have an eight, nine-year-old son at this time, and I was like, this is not um, who I want him to see or him to become, but this is what I had become. And I remember that next morning, I, I, it was like three hours later, I went to work. I normally get up around five, six in the morning. So I knew already, I had only had, had only had gotten like three, four hours of sleep. And um, here I am waking up and I feel like, I don't feel the hangover. I don't feel the, the, the scratchy throat from smoking all night long. And I, I didn't feel the headache. I didn't feel dizzy that morning. And I immediately, I thought it's like, man, God heard my prayer. I remember the thought of like wanting to go back out and do it all over again was just gone. The thought of like having conversations with different females, or those thoughts were gone. The, the thoughts of like, man, I, what's going to happen today, tomorrow? The, the, all those thoughts were gone. I answered in one short prayer of me reaching out to God. After this, I began to attend church again, and I um, I met I met somebody else. I, I met a girl named her name was Elsie, and and I was so afraid. Um, we began talking on the phone and. And I was afraid because I didn't know, I, I didn't want to take advantage of her. I didn't want to be taken advantage of. But I felt like, man, maybe I am not ready for, for the next place, for this next relationship. And I remember the first time we went out on a date, we had just the best time. and We enjoyed dinner together, but we were also both in a bad place. So we, were, we went out to a club, we were drinking together. And, and I, I, I just remember having an amazing time and taking her home really late. And I remember again waking up that following morning and I, I felt so bad that I decided to drive to her job and, and just ask her to, for, to forgive me. Because I mean, I was definitely acting out of character that night. And um, as I walked up to her job, I remember just her smiling at me and just seeing her excitement to see me. And, and we decided to see each other again like the next day. And I remember having this really long conversation with her in a Walmart parking lot. And I told her, I said, if this relationship was to ever go anywhere, um, we will both have to turn to Christ. And I said, if you're feeling the same way that I'm feeling about, you know, about each other, then um, we, we need to turn this relationship over to Christ and we need, we need to go back to what we know works. So we did that. You know, we ended up, you know, just making the adjustments and making a commitment to um, going back to church and, you know, searching for our relationship with Christ, recommitting ourselves to him. And, and that's exactly what we did from this day forward. Things began to change and things began to change very rapidly. 
in our in our walk with Christ and with each other. You know, within six months we got married. And even after getting married for me, I was like, see, I overcame. I, I overcame those thoughts of loneliness. I overcame those those thoughts of mistrust. Uh, I overcame those thoughts of like betrayal. But the reality, it wasn't. It wasn't over. Here I am. I'm married. I'm in love again. And I'm thinking all these things are just going to go away. But they didn't. The phone calls continue. You know, I remember calling my calling her constantly, trying to find out where she was. And I, I remember the, the, the levels of the thoughts of an insecurity that I felt that every time that her phone rang, I was thinking about like, who's texting you? Who's calling you? Why, why did you come home late? Um, who did you work with today? And just this thoughts of insecurity that almost cost me my marriage. And we were able to work through this. I, I say we, we probably had about two years of our marriage that we were like, some days were good, some days were bad. And, we were running to these arguments again because we were dragging our past, be, our past, our past to the present, and we got to the point that we almost lost our relationship. And then our relationship got great. You know, we we seen breakthrough. God did some things, and I thought, here it is. I overcame all these things that I was dealing with, and I overcame all these things from my past. And then I find myself in a, in, a, in a church serving as a pastor. What an opportunity! I felt like this is a, was an opportunity of a lifetime three, four years in ministry and working full-time ministry as a pastor. And, and I knew that it was an opportunity that God had given me. And, and I knew that it was all Him. There's no way it could have been me. I, I thought that my opportunity in church and ministry was over. And here I am with this amazing blessing, which came all came crashing down after three years. Again, going through the aspect of like seeing just things done in ministry out of place. And and, and I had to go through all that process of, of being insecure. I wasn't good enough. Or, um, just the thoughts of loneliness, the thoughts of that things will never get better again. I, I remember that day when me and my wife just walked away from work and we decided, I decided to take just a small landscaping job in hopes that, that things would change in the future. But, but in reality inside, I, I was faced with this darkness again of what the next day is gonna hold or how am I gonna change this? How am I gonna shift this for my family? Am I the man that I'm supposed to be doing? Why, why would I entrust my family in that ministry? Am I, how am I supposed to like answer this back? How, if God was to ask me, how would I respond to him in regards to my family? At this point, we already had two children together. So we, we had, I had four kids at home and it was just a very difficult time in my life. And one day we decided to get up early and we decided to pray. And I remember my wife decided to pray downstairs in our be bedroom and I decided to go upstairs in the living room. And this is where I felt my life change. God took me to the story that at that time it was familiar to me. Um, Second Samuel chapter 12 talks about when David has a son with Bathsheba and prophet comes to his house. His prophet's name is Nathan. And the prophet tells him that his son is going to die. So the Bible says that during during the last seven days before the child passed, David went into a place of fasting and mourning. And during this time, the Bible says he rips his clothes and he's throwing ashes upon himself. And the servants were at a distance looking at him and having a conversation after seven days. And David notices that the servants showed up to give him the news about his son passing. So David gets up and asks the question, did my son pass? And they responded, yes. And when David heard their response, the Bible says that David gets up from the dust, he shakes himself, he goes home and takes a shower, he goes and applies lotion, he goes into the temple and worship, he goes after he goes to the temple and worship, he has a meal, and then he goes and meets again with Bathsheba. The servants were in surprise because they were thinking that from, from them receiving or giving David that news of his son passing, that they were going to have to faith face judgment with David, him being the king, and they were going to be killed for that, for giving him the bad news. But in, 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 but in, in exchange, David just got up and he went about his day. So they asked David the question, he's like, how is it that we give you this bad news? And then you turn around, get up, you go and take a shower, and now you eat. You're supposed to be crying. Why did you decide not to fast after you heard the bad news? And David says, what can I do? My son is already dead. And I, I, I felt like at that moment when I read the response from David, my life just kind of stopped. And I felt like the Holy Spirit began to speak to me and told me, why are you going to continue to mourn and cry about an aspect in your life that's already dead? And I sat in silence and I kept thinking about those words and all the things that kept going through my mind 
where the difficult times that I had gone in life for probably what, for, for about seven or eight years, different times when I had considered or taking my life and I considered suicide, when I had considered just betraying and lying to people, when I became this person that I, that I said I would never become, like all these moments of, they kept flashing in my mind. And I said, I will never deal again with loneliness because that aspect of my life is already dead. I said, I will never deal again with betrayal because that area of my life is already dead. I will never live my life in despair because that area of my life is already dead. I, I kept sent, telling myself, I will never deal again with this grief because that area of my life is already dead. I kept telling myself, I'd never have to turn again to alcohol because that area that I, type, that I try feeling with alcohol, that area is already dead. It's already gone. It's already disappeared. God has already healed it. So why am I going to continue my life mourning and suffering from the things in my past if that chapter in my life is already dead? So I remember getting up from that couch and I felt like a weight was literally lifted from my life. I felt like I could breathe again. I felt like there's no sense in crying, thinking about, dwelling upon. And I tell you what, from that moment forward, anytime that the enemy has tried to bring these thoughts to my life, I could again flip again the chapter and remind the enemy that those areas in my life are already dead. And today, I'm alive in Christ. So my name is Pastor Indio, and this is how I came alive.